let's get started. And everybody, anybody else who's joining can just can just jump in whenever they can. On behalf of the French American Chamber of Commerce of Chicago, welcome and thank you very much for, for joining us for this clearly very important discussion. We have over 100, um, 100 people registered for this event. Um, and this is, as many of you know, a very timely topic. So we're really, really happy to have Maria Delap and, and Michael Terencic with us today to, um, to address it. Just a couple logistical notes. We are, um, we are recording this event. Um, we will also have a couple, uh, a couple documents that we can share with you as a follow-up after. I will send an email, follow-up email to everybody who's participating today with, uh, with the, the documents that, that Maria will be presenting. Um, just for, the, we're gonna start with the presentation from here from Michael and then from Maria. If you have questions, um, even as they're presenting, we'll address them at the end for the last 10 minutes and just write your question in the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll do the moderating and we'll, we'll address your questions then. So I just want to, um, to turn it over, turn it over to, to Michael, um, who is the board president of the FACC Chicago and an experienced immigration lawyer who spent over 30 years of his career providing strategic guidance and support for the corporate global mobility programs. He's currently senior counsel at Fragman, a global immigration firm and government relations consultant for the American Immigration Lawyers Association, the leading professional organization of the US immigration bar. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Michael who will then introduce Maria and I will let the two of you take it away. Thank you both very much. Well, uh, thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you all for showing up um, this afternoon for this um, uh, important discussion. Um, as Andrea suggested, um, we're not gonna have a formal PowerPoint today. We thought it would be more beneficial for you all to have more of a conversation uh, between Maria and myself. And I think uh, that makes a lot of sense because um, Maria and I have known each other for just about 20 years now uh, as professional colleagues um, for most of that period of time. Um, she is a, a very experienced corporate immigration attorney, currently serves as senior counsel at the law firm of Barry Appleman and Leiden and is the manager of their uh, Chicago office. So uh, that's the brief introduction for Maria. Anything else you would like to add, Maria? Or thanks so much uh, for the introduction, Michael and, and Andrew, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, just a couple of things to add, um, really about the, the firm primarily. Um, we're one of the largest, uh, most distinguished and preeminent immigration firms in the US, uh, focusing 100% on, on business immigration. Um, as Michael said, I'm managing the Chicago office, which we just opened last year here in Chicago at Madison and Wacker. Um, excited to, to, to be here. Um, wanted to highlight just a couple of brief um, uh, points and, and awards that the firm has received, which I'm very proud of and we're very proud of. We have been recognized as the top law firm for women and, and uh, the most diverse firm in the US. Uh, which I think is very important in particular in light of what we do. Um, obviously we deal with immigration and <clears throat> in a very diverse clientele. And so we wanna be sort of um, in similar position, be able to relate to, um, to, to our clients because it is such a personal thing, right? Immigration is a very personal thing for everybody regardless of whether it's based on employment sponsorship, you know, family asylum, you know, whatever the reason may be. Um, and, and because of it, um, I'm happy to be here really and, and share some information with you in hopes that it will help you guys um, with your immigration journeys or immigration journeys of your um, in, employees. So um, with that, I'm happy to, to start if you wanna Let, you Let's wanna start get off. started. And, and last but not least, um, Maria and her firm are uh, recent um, new members of the French American Chamber of Commerce in Chicago. So welcome. Thank you for joining. We look forward to working with you in the, in the months and years ahead. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask a series of questions. And again, because um, Maria is, um, again, very knowledgeable and experienced, has lots of practical insights, I'm going to launch the questions. We'll have a bit of a conversation about several topics uh, we, we are very comfortable. If we don't cover an issue that's of importance to you, feel free to put it into the chat box and, and we will try to answer that as well. Um, but we're really focusing on some timely issues um, in immigration law and boy, aren't there a lot of them. So let's start off with an issue that's probably of interest to most FACC members and their employees, which is um, the, the H-1B registration and selection process, which was just recently completed for the upcoming fiscal year. So Maria, this was the second year that the U.S. government uh, required employers to effectively pre-register uh, their employees for selection. 
Um, tell us how that went. You know, how did it, how did the registration for just the registration process for right now? How did that work? Um, any hiccups? Any surprises? Sure, it actually worked pretty smoothly. You know, last year we didn't know what to expect. This year we were hoping to see sort of similar processing, smooth process, and it went fairly smoothly. The registration itself was uh, a little bit later this year. It started on March 9th and ended on March 25th, um, but few changes, if any, substantive changes took place. Um, one thing that the government did do is include in their email notifications which lottery the person was selected under, so advanced degree or regular, but. We're not sure how substantive that changes. It helps us obviously, but um, everything else worked fairly smoothly from beginning to end so far. Okay, so the one thing I would add on that point, which is I'm just seeing, um, you know, in my in, in, in the connection, my role with the, the American Immigration Lawyers Association is that if you were, um, if you applied, if you registered under the master's degree, but you were selected under that bachelor's cap, um, and, and the notice indicates bachelor's cap, it's recommended that when you fill out the I-129, you indicate you're applying based upon the bachelor's cap. But that's the that's the only real relevance mm -hmm. of it as, as far as I've determined so far. So um, I'm, I'm minor technical thing. So, um, and you're right, it was later this year, um, partially because there was a concern um, you know, within the agency and within the immigration bar as to whether or not they were going to try to implement a wage-based selection system, which yes. thankfully, thankfully didn't happen this year. Yeah, so we, with we that, have some reprieve with that for sure. Yeah, uh, that, that, that would have been a nightmare for the, uh, for the agency and employers as well. So let's turn to the selection process. Um, it's been about a week and a half, two weeks since all the H-1 re registrations that were selected have been notified. Um, again, how did that work out? Any surprises there? The selection process was done pretty quickly. Um, really within the next couple of days after the registration closed and all the notifications have been made. The announcement by the immigration service was made on March 30th, so a day ahead of time uh, that the selection uh, in lottery process was complete. Um, the general consensus, I think, among colleagues within and outside the firm is that it's been fairly low this year, significantly lower than two years ago and, and lower than, than last year. Right, and, um, and oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think we're we're seeing in general um, anywhere from mid twenties to low to mid thirties in terms of the selection rate ultimately for the um, uh, submitted uh, registrations. The immigration service hasn't yet come out with the numbers, um, so that hopefully is to come, which will give us an idea of how many applications were entered and what the overall selection rate. But that's what we're seeing. Right. So. The USCIS ombudsman, who is sort of a public relations interface um, with USCIS, let it slip on a call about a week or so ago um, when they referred to over 300,000 registrants. So uh, the numbers were up significantly. So um, there are, as many of you know, only 85,000 CAP subject H-1B visas that can be issued for a year. So you can do the math. You can see that it's you know a, a 25 to low 30% selection rate is pretty consistent with a number somewhere in the 300s. Again, we'll find out soon what that actual number is, I would expect. So, so, that, was, uh, so, so that was unexpected, I guess. So the, the lower percentages this year, um, given everything that's happened with the economy and, and with the pandemic. Um, now, Maria, I know, you, I know you're not gonna be able to say for certain why the selection rates were so much lower this year, why applications were up, um, but have you within your firm or within you know, other members of the immigra immigration bar come up with any theories as to why this was the case? Yeah, um, I think for example, there is. Yeah, I was just saying, for example, I heard one rumor right after the selection period was, um, was completed that many um, potential H-1B workers were having multiple registrations filed for them. For, so multiple registrations for the same person, getting multiple job offers in an effort to try to game the system since the odds were obviously not in their favor. Um, but what did you hear? Um, I think that was sort of the concern, you know, from the very beginning when the electronic registration was put in place with a $10, you know, filing fee, um, of the system flooding, right, with multiple entries being made. And so um, I think some of it probably is true in particular, perhaps in certain industries, um, consulting and, and others where, um, you know, maybe just sort of the number of slots to fill versus specific individuals to bring to the U.S. 
Um, I think, you know, there's probably pent up demand given, you know, everything that's happened last year, um, the hiring has picked up. So it's certainly possible that a lot of folks got, you know, multiple job offers and had those multiple employers enter them into the lottery, which is not, um, you know, prohibited by the, by the current regulations. What's prohibited is, is duplicates right. or triplicate right. entries by the same employer. So I think all of those things um, probably led to um, increased demand, as well as, you know, the fear that the rules are going to be changing, even with a new administration, we'll touch upon it a little bit later. Um, you know, while the Trump administration rules that were impacting the H-1B definitions, the, you know, wage prioritization for the lottery didn't go in effect, they weren't canceled out either. And, and in concept, at least, they align with um, some of the, you know, platform uh, you know, concepts of the Biden administration. So it is still very much on, um, you know, on the review plate for the new administration. And I think the concern in the industry and just within the U.S. immigration, you know, business field that um, we will see sort of a lower um, or a more narrow definition for H-1Bs and eligibility that will be limited at some point in the future. So that potentially led to more entries as well. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's pretty accurate. I think that some um, some of the firms saw that some of the more restrictive rules with respect to qualifying the employer employee relationship and um, documenting itineraries, um, you know, were, were, no, were no longer being applied by the agency. And because of that, it was um, a, a simpler process to get H-1Bs ultimately um, not just registered and filed, but approved. Right. So that created some additional incentives. And you know, I just saw within the last couple of days, um, looking out there, there are actually um, web-based platforms that connect F1 students with potential H1B employers. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting. There, there's almost a, a facilitation process there. And you know, I, I, as you said before, um, what, this is not per se illegal, right? So if Correct. an employee, a prospective employee gets more than one job offer, that's nothing new, that's happened before. Um, it may not have happened maybe to the extent that's being alleged out there um, in social media, but I, I, think, I think that um, you know, there are um, real concerns. Um, if I'm an F1 student, just hypothetically, and you know, the system suggests that I've got a one in three or one or four chance of getting a work visa that allows me to continue my career in the United States, I'm going to take a hard look at all legal options that are going to give me a better chance uh, of winning in that selection process. So core issue here is that 85,000 H-1B visas, that number really hasn't been changed for many, many, many years. And it was created at a time when the economy was um, not as, as large and, and robust as it, as it is today. Demand for H-1Bs was very different back then. Um, so one of the issues, and we may touch upon this later when we talk about some legislative initi initiatives is, there really hasn't been anything um, significantly done with the H-1B visa category to make it more responsive to the business community in 2021. Um, so, but, but let's, move on. let's move on in the interest of time. All right, so um, you've been selected. Okay, your registration was completed. Your, um, your employees were selected. What's next? Where does the process go from here? So we're in the 90 day filing period right now. So we have until June 30th to submit all of the H-1B petitions for the folks that were selected in the lottery for processing to the immigration service. This year, unlike many previous years, immigration service hasn't suspended premium processing options. So a lot of employers are choosing to file cases under premium processing um, to get the hopefully approval expedited or uh, the issuance of, of an RFE uh, to come sooner. The immigration service is expected to process those in the next several months if the premium processing is not included, if premium processing uh, request is included with the filing, uh, they should process it in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so that's where we are with those that have been selected in the H-1B process. Some employers uh, choose to prepare full petitions prior to filing uh, the lottery registrations. Um, others chose not to do it. Some sort of ended up somewhere in between with at least the LCA partial preparation of the cases. So um, if, if you know, you, you have employees, you may be currently working at preparing those HMBs uh, versus already submitting them if, if they've already been 
uh, prepared in, in, in the past. So um, right now we're right in the middle of the filing season for those H1Bs. Right, right. So going back to processing time, so the, the premium processing time, again, it's, it's like 15 days, um, which, which is um, incredibly fast for USCIS these days. What, what are the general processing times? It's, is it still you know, several months um, it is, or has that changed much? Yeah. It is still several months and it's it's yeah. been very inconsistent. So we, yeah. we have seen right. some H's being processed fairly quickly um, and historically with cap cases in particular, we see sort of some being processed very quickly even without pre processing and others just right. sit for, for, for many, many months. The official processing times um, are right. close to six months. So then if the start date for all of these H-1B petitions can be no earlier than October 1st of this year, premium processing is not necessary necessarily to get a decision, but it's probably good advice just because of the high incidence of, or at least the previously high incidence of requests for additional evidence that just extended the process. So if, if there was a need to get someone on board you know, by October, um, general processing times may not be the best way, way to do that, so. Yeah, and in, in some instances, I think it is definitely recommended in particular if um, the individuals are not in the US and they still have to apply for, you know, visa abroad and we're gonna discuss, you know, what right. fun process that is yeah. um, these yeah. days, you know, if their current status is running out. So it, in some right. instances, it definitely is recommended. Yeah, and, and, and the other point is that, you know, that 90 day window is, is a hard stop, I mean, if, if you're not able to successfully file your petition within that 90, if you're selected in this round and you're not able to file in that 90 day period, you're essentially out of luck, right? Yes, um, yeah. for the first lottery, if, if there is another lottery. <laughs> there might be others, yeah. But I think the point is last year we saw some incidences where petitions were filed and they were rejected by the agency uh, either erroneously or for some minor omission on the on the part of the employer or their lawyer. And if you file at the end of this 90 day period, you may not have time to correct whatever defect may, may have existed. So word to the wise, I think is always to try to get these filed as, as, as soon as possible. That's correct. On top of it, you also kind of have to be mindful of the new form additions that the um, Immigration Service introduced, although delayed it for the I-129 filing forms to July 1, but for dependents, right, who may be filing right. their H-4 applications along with the principal, uh, those new forms come in effect on April 19th, I believe. So if those have been prepared, um, they may need to be either submitted right away or re-prepared and, right. and resubmitted after the 19th when the new form and, editions and, and go there's always the issue, you know, And there's always the issue of individuals who have that student OPT and want to make sure they have no gaps Correct. in their employment authorization. So File early. I mean, just, just the best advice is if you're able to file, file as, as soon as possible. So unless you have to wait to get your degree and then you can file oh. later. <laughs> right, right. That's that's a very good, you know, you always have to be eligible for the visa request, the visa that you're requesting on the date that you file. You can't just say, well, right. I'm going to get my degree in a few weeks. Can't we just get it started? Yeah, it, it, it unfortunately does not work that um, easily. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about the other part, The in fact, the larger part of the H-1B registration pool, which is um, those who are not selected. Um, do they have any hope at this point? Um, maybe. Um, you know, last year the government did hold a second lottery at the end of the summer. Um, but I think what we all have to keep in mind is last year, I'm not sure it was a good sort of um, measuring stick, right, given what happened last year with, with COVID and, and drastic adjustments that all U.S. employers had to make uh, with respect to their U.S. workforce with furloughs and, and layoffs right. and sort right. of adjusting down. So um, that in, in a big part probably contributed to a lower number of filings vis-a-vis the number of selected individuals last year, which probably meant that you know the government found those unused numbers at the end of the filing season right. uh, and opened up the second lottery. So I'm not sure if we're going to see that same second lottery this year, or if we do, how substantive it will be in terms of numbers. Yeah. So right. with that in mind, you know we are talking to our clients about their options in terms of you know perhaps pursuing other visas if there are other other options 
um, going back to school, you know, if they're working for multinational uh, corporations with offices outside of the U.S. or if remote employment is possible, potentially looking to, to depart the U.S. It's important to, I think, start those conversations, uh, in particular if the current work authorization is expiring soon. Right. right. One other factor I would add, I think, you know, last, last year, between last year and this year, that may be different. And yes, you're talking about year one of a new system versus year two. So we really don't have much of a track record for comparison, but um, I, I would anticipate, and no hard data to believe this other than the fact that there've been some changes in the rules, that the denial rates of H-1B petitions may be lower uh, this year than, than last year. So um, I would not count on, long story short, I would not count on a, a second selection process like we did receive um, last year. Um, I've had conversations with other lawyers where they have different opinions, but my opinion is it's probably more likely than not that the group that's been accepted is going to be the it, group that yeah. will be processed for this year. Yeah, so I, I, I would agree with you. I think, you know, until that registration status changes to not selected, which it hasn't, we <laughs> won't know for sure. Um, but short of that, I, I, we're not right. expecting a, a, a second a second lottery this year, or at least a right. substantive one. So, so the bottom line is once you get all your H-1B petitions filed or, or simultaneously with your H-1B petitions being filed, Maria, you're going to be working with everyone to have some viable plan B in place for everyone else, right? Yep. And we've already been discussing that, right. you know, when the cases were initiated, but at this right. point, it's sort of a more, you know, unfortunately definite um, There's a little bit more clarity now than there was just yeah. a few weeks ago. Sure, sure. All right, let's, let's move on. Um, that's you know another critical issue I think um, for our members and maybe the most critical issue is um, the challenge of getting non-immigrant and immigrant visas issued at a U.S. consular embassy abroad. Um, now, as we all know, I mean the the COVID-related restrictions imposed over the past year or so, um, as well as the corresponding limits on consular operations, have severely severely restricted visa processing abroad. Maria. Now that President Biden has been in office for, I think today is the 78th day of his first 100 days, can you provide an overview of what's changed during that period? And more importantly, maybe what hasn't changed in terms of consular operations? Certainly. Um, and as you mentioned, I think it's important to first make sure we all keep in mind that there are sort of two things going on, right? There, there are those COVID related restrictions and closures that impacted all of us, regardless of where we are, and regardless of what we were trying to do, right? Everything sort of got shut down last year, about a year ago. Um, on top of that, when it comes to US visa processing, as you mentioned, there are a number of travel bans that have been in place, were in place uh, during the, the Trump era. Um, so what I wanted to do really quickly is uh, share my screen for just this um, particular topic to kind of help visualize, um, you know, where, what travel bans we're talking about. Uh, starting from the bottom, hopefully you guys can see my, my screen. Um, we had uh, the Muslim travel ban that was instituted by the Trump administration back in 2017, almost immediately, right, when, when they came to, um, to power. It took them three tries to, to get it in and ultimately a Supreme Court decision back in 2018, but that has been in place since then. So there is a pent up demand, right, that, that you know, restricted number of uh, Muslim visa applicants and, and African country applicants from getting their visas into the U.S. That ban has been revoked on first day of the Biden administration. So that is no longer in effect. But again, we have almost you know three plus years worth of pent up demand for those individuals. Um, there are two additional labor market as we're calling them bans that were put in in place by the Trump administration last year, one in April, limiting the issuance of immigrant visas, um, which is essentially green cards that are processed from outside of the US. Uh, and another in June of last year, limiting the issuance of the H, L, and J visas uh, or, or work visas. So there's been a year worth of pent up demand for those. Um, both of those bans were uh, revoked or rescinded by the Biden administration, one in February and one just you know, nine days ago in, in, in March. So no longer in effect, neither the Muslim ban or the labor market immigrant visa bans. However, what does remain in effect and without an upcoming expiration date 
are the regional COVID-19 travel bans, which apply to uh, anybody who stepped foot in any of the 33 countries that are impacted by the bans. Uh, namely, there are the 26 Schengen area countries, France including, UK, Ireland, Brazil, China, South Africa, and Iran. So if you have been present in those countries during the last 14 days, you're prohibited from entry into the US. And the way the immigration uh, and, and Department of State uh, and, and US government are interpreting this ban uh, is also to apply to US visa issuance. So that's restricting visa applications and US visa issuance to anybody in those impacted countries. Again, this remains in, in effect um, with no expected expiration days. There's been some, I think, discussion, some rumors about some of the bans being potentially lifted in the coming months. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that the focus of the new administration, uh, despite its less anti-immigrant sort of uh, uh, you know, rhetoric is very much on preventing, you know, COVID spread and limiting travel unless absolutely necessary. So we don't really expect um, those to be lifted anytime soon completely. What I think we're expecting is to see some modifications, uh, perhaps lifting in certain areas, uh, hopefully as the COVID numbers go down in particular jurisdictions. So it's not just the U.S., it's, you know, France, it's right. Brazil, it's China, it, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah, I would just add on that one point that um, I think the, the vaccination um, efforts and processes in the respective countries will play a significant role uh, in the relaxation of, of some of the travel bans, particularly with respect to the Schengen and the EU area where Quite frankly, it's it's not gotten off to the, as quick a start that as 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 anyone would like, right? So I think that it all would acknowledge that it could. We'd all like to see that moving faster. So when the vaccination rates go up and the infection rates go down, I think you'll see much like the CDC is doing here in the United States, yep. there'll be some relaxation of um, of um, access. And I also think one of the things you'll see soon, and this is not. I, I think you are right. It's it's not only just a ban on entry, it's really being used in many consulates, maybe not all, as a ban on applications, right? So I think that will open up next. It's a different thing to have the visa in your passport, but uh, a separate and apart from uh, being able to enter the United States. So hopefully, and I know that there are, you know, very, very serious immigration lawyers who are planning litigation on that issue. Uh, hopefully that will happen so you, it was filed yesterday, I think, with yes, the federal was. district right. of DC um, and that exact issue of distinguishing entry from, from visa. Right, right. And there have been several posts, including the ones in China that have just shut, some of the posts in China that have just shut down um, right. in terms of operations for non-immigrant visas. So, um, so the other side of this is, um, it, one, there's this kind of backlog, but there's also, again, you know, reduced access at the consulates, right? So consular operations have been limited, consulates have been closed or operating under very restricted circumstances for a while now. And that's created just an, an immense backlog issue in terms of both immigrant and non-immigrant visas. So Maria, do you have any information on the extent of the backlogs and you know what is the US government doing to address them? And, and do you have any information particularly with respect to Paris? Yeah, so, you know, just without even any numbers, when you think about it, again, a year worth of backlog of all work visas and immigrant visas and three plus years of a backlog of, of uh, specific sort of regional, right, Muslim ban and African um, applicants, um, that's significant. It would normally take U.S. consulate, I think, you know, months to get on top of that backlog if they were fully open. And as you mentioned, COVID restrictions are in place um, and they are impacting U.S. consulate as they are impacting many businesses and, and other operations in many countries. So um, U.S. consulates are dealing with limiting staffing, social distancing, limiting number of folks in the waiting rooms and outside. So all of that is contributed to lower number appointments and um, availability. Um, you know, we understand right now the focus of the U.S. consulates in most instances are dealing, uh, U.S. missions abroad are dealing with U.S. citizens that are present abroad. That's priority number one. Priority number two are immigrant visa issuance, in particular for those categories that have been impacted by the travel bans. Um, and then focusing on urgent need travel, right? Those, uh, you know, diplomatic visas, 
uh, and, and others that absolutely require to, to be in the US uh, because of what they do and, and the nature of their, and their jobs. Non-immigrant visas are sort of the last priority for the consulates to deal with. So the travel and visa applications are still sort of discouraged, frankly, from the US uh, consulate perspective. And, and we're seeing that with the policies that are being published. Um, in terms of Paris specifically, um, you know, if you look on their appointment availability and the Department of State to check how early can you secure an appointment, it's a whopping 256 days across the board. So if you were to try to schedule an appointment today, you'd be looking at the end of the year. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. That's just, you know, how the, the system is set up. Paris is limiting the um, applicants who can apply at the US Embassy in Paris only to those who are physically present in France and, and Monaco. Um, so if you're physically present in another country, if you're still in the US and you're hoping to sort of, you know, figure out if you could get an exemption, if you could apply, you may not be allowed to because you're not physically present in, in, in France. Further, if you are lucky to get an appointment and secure an earlier appointment through an emergency appointment process, which we'll touch upon shortly, um, you will not be allowed into the embassy if you've been present outside of France in the last 10 days. So essentially, there's a 10-day quarantine that's being imposed in, in Paris uh, for all international travelers. So if you've traveled abroad um, and you have an appointment in Paris, you have to wait 10 days to, to, to attend it. So those are just some measures that, that we are seeing. And one of the leave behind materials is gonna be a, 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 a slide deck that uh, Council General of the Paris Embassy shared with us just a couple of weeks ago um, in French actually discussing the process of applying for the national interest exemption and uh, a way to secure an expedited appointment and the latest update from, from the website as well, sort of describing the same process in English. So we'll share all of that with you guys shortly. But but yes, we are seeing delays. We are seeing uh, huge backlogs and, and Paris is no exception. So that's a great, Maria, that's a great segue. But before we segue to national interest exemptions, I just want to say I did check some of the other larger consulates um, in Europe. And actually as, as challenging as Paris is, it's not necessarily the worst. Several posts such as Frankfurt, um, London and um, what's Rome, uh, I think are essentially saying um, we're only taking um, emergency appointments. We're not even trying to schedule anyone for nine or 10 months out. So um, at least, you know, Paris is, is, is the, the door may be open a little bit, but it's better than some of the, um, some of the other. Yeah, places. and I think that is a very important point to make is uh, very much the inconsistency, right? Yeah. From post yep. to post. Because again, all of this is driven by the local, you know, COVID situation in, in part, um, staffing at the consulate and other part. So you're gonna see very different processes that frankly are gonna be changing with little or no notice uh, as those local conditions adjust and change as well. So um, checking the consulate website, checking frequently uh, and reaching out to your immigration providers to get sort of the most up-to-date right. information would be the, the, the thing to do if you're planning on traveling. Right, but, and always keeping in mind that because of COVID, you know, many, many countries may have that sort of quarantine mm -hmm. requirement that you mentioned with respect to Paris, but let's move on. Um, okay, you talked about... Yeah. Michael, you're freezing up a little bit. We'll give you a minute. Uh, Maria, there is a question in here, which you sort of you sort of addressed already, but I'm just going to throw it out there um, sure. while we're waiting. The is the, is the French um, is the French consulate allowed to issue v visas even if the COVID nineteen travel ban is still in effect in France, uh, or, do, or will they only issue if if you if we apply for an NIE? So you, you do have to qualify for the NIE in order for the uh, French uh, or the U.S. consulate in, in Paris and in France to issue you a visa. Uh, that's the only way to qualify these days. Um, and the same applies, you know, regardless of different visa categories. Um, so really quickly, I guess we can cover while Michael rejoins the national interest exemption uh, protocol that Paris shared with us. It's available on their website and its current as of right now, as I mentioned, uh, it certainly can change. It's reflective of the, the most recent Department of State guidance that was put in place in early March. 
um, changing how the U.S. consulates have been sort of evaluating who is and isn't eligible for any of the travel ban exemptions. Um, with Paris specifically, what they're looking for you to do if you're applying for a visa or if you are trying to enter the U.S. and ESTA, the thing to keep in mind is, as we mentioned, the, the, the ban applies to you regardless of whether you have a visa or not. Um, so if you are planning on traveling to the U.S., even if you have a valid visa, but you've been present in, in, in France uh, and um, are not planning on going quarantining somewhere uh, for 14 days, which is always an option with Croatia and Mexico and Dubai being popular options, um, you have to submit an email to the consulate with uh, some of the uh, very specific sort of subject line note with certain attachments and an explanation and answers to five questions that the consulate said, unless you provide this information, we're not even going to consider your application. Um, the questions that they want you to address these days are critical uh, infrastructure, uh, industry that you work is in, so specifying what that is, um, explaining what specific activities you intend to perform in the US, explaining how those activities relate to the critical infrastructure and support it. And even if you are able to show those three things, which are sort of prerequisite minimum, the key I think in the focus right now is explaining the next two things, why those activities require your physical presence in the US and why um, the alternatives such as, you know, video conferencing or remote employment um, will not allow you to, um, to, to do what you need to do, which is gonna be difficult to, to show, you know, if you have been remotely working from outside of the US during the last year. So the shift very much has been in the last month or so to focus on physical presence in the US, you know, shifting perhaps from those senior managers and executives um, that were allowed to qualify for NIEs in the past, Right now, it's really the doers, if you will, right, who have to be present in the U.S., who have to um, uh, do what they do physically here versus remotely uh, as the prerequisite for processing any, any NIEs. So I'm back. I apologize. My internet went down for two minutes. Um, <laughs> it hasn't gone down in weeks, just for the record, but it went down today. So um, um, no, no explanation now, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll be looking into that as soon as this is over. Um, so, so Mar Maria, um, help me catch up here. Um, I, we, I, I, we talked I, about the NIEs in Paris okay. and being able to get visas there um, okay. without NIEs, which you essentially cannot. One additional sort of bit that I wanted to offer yeah. is uh, the, the timeline that the Consul General shared with us. Right now in Paris, they're taking at least seven to 10 days to review the NIE request, the National Interest Exemption request. So um, nothing is moving quickly. And I think you have to expect delays across right. the board in Paris and, and um, outside. So everything is being, so this is presumably because of the nine to 10 month delay that we talked about before. You're talking about individuals with existing visas, right? I mean, who are, who are making applications to come back to the US? Um, individuals with existing visas uh, or those without visas, right, to try to secure an appointment and try to show why they're eligible for the visa, they have to oh, go through the, this process, yep, yep, yeah, um, so, yeah. as well as those that are traveling to the U.S. and ESTA are also right. required to obtain this uh, uh, permission from the consulate to, to enter the U.S. unless they plan on, you know, going and essentially spending right. two weeks elsewhere. Right. So... Uh, I imagine there's a lot of volume there, as I understand. They're all single yes. entry for 30 days. So individuals who may be traveling now as um, travel starts, appears to be picking up again, um, are spending a lot of time processing these requests, I would imagine. So. Yes, and I think um, the other thing to, uh, to keep in mind is just because you got the permission the first time may not qualify you for the next time. Oh, um, so. Yeah. It's a, it's a one-time permission, as Michael said, um, and uh, every time you have to apply, the likelihood is they may not grant you unless the you know, requirements change and this uh, goes oh. away. Well, in fact, the requirements did change right about a month ago. Or, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So they changed a little over a month ago. So if you had um, an NIE granted then, um, before then, 
um, you may not be able to get it now. In fact, pretty likely you, you may not be able to get it now. So Correct. they're um, not revoking what was granted under the old standard. So you can right. still use it if you haven't, um, although from a timing perspective, it's unlikely at this point. Um, but, but as Michael said, you're, you're uh, likely are going to be less eligible under the current standard. So other than don't travel, right? Don't travel. What other advice are you giving to your clients? So, you know, for some, it's just not a luxury, right? Some have to go back home um, if they're in the U.S. Um, and so it's really um, trying to have that conversation with, with everybody, proactively sort of advising them of all the things to keep in mind, um, the delays that are possible, the expecting you know, the unexpected with border closures and these types right. of changing priorities um, and, and evaluation standards. So all of that is a must. Um, you know, to kind of keep in mind for any travel. If you do have to travel, you know, planning perhaps direct flights, right? Avoiding those right. countries that are subject, would subject you to the travel ban um, or, you know, making a detour and spending some time in the third country that doesn't right. subject you to the, to the, um, to the ban. So all of these are, are factors to discuss. We're also obviously talking to employers about planning for longer absences for the employees, planning for remote employment. And unlike the U.S. where, you know, depending on the visa, it may not matter where you're based, although with certain visas, it very much matters which right. location you're working from. Working from abroad may trigger tax implications. So working with your tax providers to evaluate what that means, you know, if your employee is stuck and not able to come back to the U.S. So all of those are sort of very difficult conversations that we're having. And on top of it, checking the local, you know, quarantine testing and other requirements that are outside of immigration, it's just travel related issues that all of us have to be aware of if we're right. jumping on the plane anytime soon. All right, so let's let's move on. I think we have maybe between five and 10 minutes left before, before we're gonna leave some time for questions. Um, um, the, the next topic I'd like to raise is, um, is the operations of the agency that adjudicates immigration benefits requests, um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS. Um, in prior uh, FACC presentations on this topic, you know, we've highlighted the increased scrutiny of virtually all types of petitions and applications uh, with um, USCIS issuing denials or lengthy requests for evidence in, in really, really not virtually, really unprecedented numbers. So I guess, it's still early, so realizing it's still very early in the Biden administration, have you seen any changes or trends in adjudications at USCIS yet? Um, it is too early to tell, I think, but we we have started to see some changes, even sort of in the in the tail end of the Trump administration. I think probably in, in light of all the sort of you know uh, lawsuits that they did not win. Um, in in you know, in particular, when it comes to H-1B specialty occupation RFEs, that, those I think have gone down um, significantly from the early days of the right. administration. Sure. Um, we, in, in talking to colleagues outside of the firm, we're still seeing some pretty outrageous denials occasionally. Um, some RFEs that frankly are the only explanation that I would have are due to staffing, lack of training, lack of supervision. So we're really hoping and very excited to see you know, the agency getting back to consistent processing, processing that's consistent with the regulations, the rules of just simply applying the law as it should be applied versus putting in some, you know, spins that, that yep. you know, don't stand up to uh, court review. So early to tell yet, but, but we're optimistic that we will see changes. Right. I think one of the challenges right now, at least for the agency, is that it still doesn't have a director. USCIS director still has not been formally appointed. Um, you know, DHS has a director and it's a cabinet level position. And you've, I'm sure we've all seen Alan Mayorkas um, on any number of, of television news shows, but actually the head of USCIS is not in place. That's not unusual. Typically when there's a change in administration, it can take several months for all of the key administration positions to be filled out. In fact, last time, four years ago, it wasn't until the summer or late fall that USCIS had a director. So some of these changes may may require, uh, you know, a leadership to be in place and to be implementing some of these policy changes. Um, but moving on again, in the interest of time, a separate note, you know, 
We've also talked over the years about government processing times. Um, they've, they've soared in recent years. They've caused workers and spouses difficulty in obtaining and maintaining employment authorization. Um, what are you seeing there? Any, any, any news that's positive at all? Uh, we are seeing delays, um, unfortunately. And, and while we are hoping to see some reduction in processing times in particular for those extension and, and work permit applications for spouses, um, which have been the subject of several lawsuits. So for nothing else, if the outcome of the lawsuits would lead to some sort of expediency, that would be great. Um, uh, we have seen some uh, positive trends. We are seeing some applications being processed a little bit quicker, um, but we're not seeing consistent processing um, at all um, still. So keeping our fingers crossed for, for something changes changing there, but unfortunately the staffing, the budget issues that, that the immigration services experienced are probably not going to be quick fixes, right, to, to, to go through. Right. So um, I've got my ideas, but um, let me ask you, um, you know, if, if you were advising Secretary Mayorkas, um, how to fix processing at USCIS. Are, do you have any quick and easy suggestions on what the agency can do to just improve the efficiency of its operations? Sure, nobody's called, but if they do. Um, if you're ready, be ready, always be, be ready. Be ready, I'm, I'm always ready. I think you know the easiest in my opinion is sort of using the tools that they already have in place, right? So um, utilizing premium processing, I mean, that that's, Sort of an easy answer, right? It's it's twenty five hundred dollars for most applications uh, for just processing them in reasonable period of time. Um, that's an influx of fees, which will help with staffing, budget, etc. Um, removing all the hurdles that the last administration have put in place. For example, um, you know, interviews for green card applicants never used to be required for most employment based cases. Now there are, that's a huge, you know, staffing issue for the immigration service to handle all those at the local offices. So doing away with that, um, reintroducing the deference memo that allowed sort of easier processing of extensions filed for the same employee by the same employer that was rescinded. So we're hoping that rescission to be rescinded <laughs> this, with this administration. So making it a little bit easier to process simple applications. Um, doing away with biometrics requirements for dependent spouses and utilizing, as some of the lawsuits make clear, which is possible, utilizing biometrics collected by other agencies, you know, visa consulates and, and, and such yep. for other cases. Um, we have already started seeing, you know, interview waivers and biometric waivers for some applications. So we're hoping that's a positive trend that will continue. But those would be my suggestions. And I think yep. one that's less... Um, easy to implement and, and less of a short term, but more of a longer term um, fix would be improving the channels of communication, opening those back up, which will help obviously all of us to know how to file things, you know, get a hold of the immigration service and sort of deal with uh, the ongoing processing a little bit easier. Yeah, and, and I would argue on that last point, Maria, that it also helps the agency because oh, absolutely. Um, th 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 those of us who are practicing um, and, and have been practicing in this field for many, many years can actually provide them with insights to, to, to help them uh, be more efficient and effective in, in performing the, you know, the essential yeah, functions absolutely. they perform. Um, you know, and, and as I've said in prior presentations, I think the, the last four years, uh, we've seen the agency throw a lot of sand in the gears of their own operations to slow things down. And it was quite clear from early on that that was, that was not um, accidental or inadvertent. Um, so I think just taking some of those steps, as you, as you said, and, and rescind the rescissions uh, could go a long way to having some near-term improvements in efficiency. So I had one last topic that I was hoping to cover. I think in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to take a minute or two. And, and that's um, just highlighting some of the many legislative proposals uh, that have been introduced um, affecting immigration. Um, I think, um, you know, certainly, you know, on, on, uh, apropos to our last point, um, changing the law to improve consistency and transparency in immigration processing can make a big difference. But the reality is, you know, we've been working for the better part of two decades trying to pass meaningful reforms in immigration law um, and, and, and so far have been unsuccessful. And now in 2021, we have narrow, uh, narrow margins in both chambers. Um, 
you know, that means bipartisanship, bipartisanship is going to be essential to pass major immigration le legislation, uh, assuming tactical options like budget reconciliation are not viable in the immigration context. Um, we also have an issue that was um, somewhat un un unanticipated. Uh, maybe not fully anticipated or the extent wasn't anticipated, um, which is the issue at the border. And I don't care if you call it a crisis, I don't care what you call it, it's taken a lot of momentum away from um, comprehensive immigration reform. Um, in fact, I'm starting to see concerns about whether uh, much of the agenda, the immigration reform agenda of the Biden administration can be accomplished at all this year. So um, if that's the case, um, trying to move something as, as controversial as comprehensive immigration reform in 2022, when you have 435 members of the House of Representatives and one third of the Senate running for re-election, um, to me, it would seem optimistic, almost to the point of being maybe a little you know, naive. So uh, I'm not gonna go through, um, there's a lot of legislation that I would hope would get passed. Certainly we need to do something about the DACA beneficiaries and there's legislation uh, to address that. Um, there's legislation legislation to enter to 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 address um, the farm workforce shortages that many um, uh, people in the agricultural industry, many businesses in the agricultural industry are experiencing. And there's legislation um, to impact that. I will take one second to talk about the president's immigration reform proposal, the U.S. Citizenship uh, Act. Um, it does a lot of things. It's a, it's a it is the comprehensive immigration proposal of this. Um, of this administration. It, it addresses DACA, it, it addresses farm workers, uh, it addresses asylum reform, legalization. Uh, it does many things um, that um, would, I think, address longstanding um, weaknesses and deficiencies of our immigration system. Um, on the business immigration side, it does some things that are unquestionably helpful in terms of reducing backlogs, um, eliminating quotas, um, making it easier for U.S. Uh, for foreign graduates of U.S. schools to stay here, but I think the most important point is that the, I would add is that it's not all good for the business community. So um, it gives DHS the authority to reduce green card availability on a yearly basis based upon macroeconomic macroeconomic um, conditions. I.e., if an unemployment goes up, then visa quotas might be reduced. It also, as as um, as Maria mentioned earlier, there's a wage-based allocation system for H-1B workers in the law. There are also um, some expansion of anti-discrimination protections for non-immigrants uh, with all employment authorization. So there are some things that would be very challenging um, for, uh, for um, employers and, and workers under the new system. So it doesn't look like the big bill, the big Biden bill is gonna be moving on its own and maybe moving in pieces, but it's important to keep an eye on which pieces are moving and how they're being moved. If, if they're being moved in the budget reconciliation process, um, much of that as you probably have, have seen in the last few months can be, can be passed with, it's just a simple majority in the Senate. So uh, something to keep an eye on. So Maria, um, before we move to Q&A, any final um, thoughts or questions or issues that you would like to cover? I have not looked at the questions in the queue yet, but um, and, you know, the floor is yours for last comments, Maria. Sure. Um, really quickly wanted, and I tried to address a couple of questions while we were talking. Um, one quick note regarding I-9s, if you happen to be an HR professional and are completing the I-9s, uh, you've been able to do so without the in-person uh, verification of employment documentation in the US. Uh, contact your immigration provider to discuss. There's been a recent guidance posted with slight changes from, from the government that those protections are still in place, but make sure you have uh, a process in place or thinking of the process of how to comply with the in-person provision um, once those relaxed rules are, are lifted. Um, and I wanted to kind of end on a, on a positive note here, I guess. Um, and we've talked a lot about restrictions and issues and, and hurdles that remain. Um, you know, I think we have already all seen a change, less of this Twitter-based, you know, whiplash, you know, policy making, which I think I'll speak to all as a very welcome change, not just on the immigration front. Um, so we are seeing some very small, but I think very significant changes with opening up of those lines of communication. So government agencies planning to attend immigration conferences, which they haven't done in the last four years, 
um, opening up, you know, some uh, communication via the customer service, although that's um, a bit of a stretch, but hopefully we'll continue to do that. Uh, rescinding some of the Trump era policies, you know, things like blank space form rejection or inviting folks whose adjustment applications were rejected erroneously last year uh, to reapply. So we're seeing, you know, those small steps um, that hopefully will lead to, to more of that. And we're very excited to get back to whatever the new norm may be, right? right. But a, a much more normal process and consistent process, um, so, which we'll so, share with you. So, so to sum up then maybe, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. Uh, we are not near that the end of that tunnel yet. It's gonna take a while. I mean, it took, um, as, as I've said with colleagues and we've discussed, it took four years, four plus years to get where we are right now because not everything started with the last administration. There were some issues um, that we had with the prior administration. Um, you know, you know, it, it took a while to get here. It's going to get a while to, to get back to where we think we want to be in terms of a transparent, consistent, predictable uh, immigration system. So with that, it's 101 on the dial. So I am going to turn it back to Andrea for any questions and closing comments. Uh, thank you very much. Do you want, do you want me to try to do a, a, a lightning round and throw just a few questions all at once to both of you? Or, or do you want to kind of end on, on Maria's uh, positive note and... Uh... I, I, I'm happy to take a few. I think we both okay. have, we have, we have, um, you have, you know, you have a couple extra minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, but we, we can, we can hang on for a few. So, you know, okay. um, we're going to leave it to you to pick the best question. All right. Let me, let me just, I'm just going to throw out, um, throw out a couple and then let you decide who's going to answer what. All right. First one. Um, is there, is there a, um, can you, can you say anything about, uh, visas for, um, I'm sorry, remote work for visa for visa holders due to COVID and beyond and we're, as work sites begin reopening and many employers start to move toward more flexible work policies. So what is remote work? What are the implications of remote work on visas? That's the first one. Um, second question, is there a freelance visa for somebody working six to 12 months in the US? And then the third one that I just wanted to throw in there because it might apply to be applicable for several people from somebody who's coming um, with his wife is on a J-1 visa as a teacher and will be coming to the US under a J-2. When her J-1 expires, will it be possible for him for him to sponsor her on his J-2 after her J-1 expires? All right, and I will stop there and let you, you decide. All right, so, so Maria, I'm gonna give you one, I'll take two, and then it's a jump ball on three. <laughs> it's up to you, okay? Right. Um, the first question was remote work, I believe, right? In, in the US. So the answer really depends on the visa. There are a number of visas that uh, require physical or where physical location is very important. H1Bs, um, E3s and others where the LCA, the labor construction application is required. So for those, you know, remote employment or really any differing work site potentially impacts the visa and requires an amendment if you work outside of whatever was listed as the area of employment on the, on the petition to begin with. Uh, for other visas, it's less critical. Um, so it may not really make a difference whether you work from location A or location B. So the short answer is yes, it depends on, on the type of visa that, that you're on. Uh, and I think a lot of employers are having this conversation, has been having this conversation, right, during the last year of what that means, uh, both for the visas as well as for the green card process for their employees, which uh, on the green card side, that is also location-based in most circumstances. So how the, the jobs are structured, where the jobs are located, does have an impact on the immigration process, and we are having those conversations with, with our clients. So number two, and sort of overlaps a little bit with something I want to say about number one, is that one of the opportunities that hasn't been um, really seized yet um, in terms of legislative change is adapting our immigration regime to the, um, the new realities that we're dealing post-COVID. Um, one of them is with respect to remote employment and people working in different locations than they were um, intended to work a year, 18 months ago. So that's one deficiency, I think, uh, really does require some focus. And the other, the other is the fact that the nature of global mobility uh, may be changing. You may see more short-term assignments like the ones you were suggesting, six, eight, nine, 12 months, uh, maybe even shorter than, than nine or 12 months. 
and there really isn't a visa. The short answer to question two, there isn't really a visa category for that in, under US law at the present time. Um, but that's not to say that there shouldn't be. There should be a visa for entrepreneurs. There should be a visa for startups. Um, there should be um, categories where we're actually trying to attract talent and entrepreneurship um, to our country rather than creating barriers to it. So you want to take the J2 sponsoring a J1, Maria? That unfortunately is an easy one and a short one. The answer is no. Uh, a yeah. J2 is a dependent visa of the J1. So really, if the J1 is no longer employed or, or have the basis to be in the US, neither does J2. So you can sort of flip flop unless J2 obtains a J1 and then can sponsor the, the spouse. Um, they, they do have a period of time to remain in the US after the completion of the assignments and, and should speak to the uh, J1 employer to, to reconfirm what that is. But the, the answer to the specific question is unfortunately no. I wouldn't change a word. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both very much. Clearly we could go on for, for another 20 minutes. I mean, we, I, we, we would probably even talk about doing a, a follow-up to this uh, to this conversation in a few months, but thank you both very much for, for yeah. getting so much into um, so many of these very complicated questions into, into an hour. Um, and we will, we will definitely want to hear more sometime soon. Uh, I will follow up to everybody with everybody who registered for this event with Michael and, and Maria's contact information and your, um, your, the documents that you presented. Um, and thank you all very much for, for being here today. And, and please don't hesitate to, um, to give me a, send me an email back if you have any questions or if you wanna be connected with one of our presenters. Exactly. Thank you for, thank you all for attending. Yeah. Maria and Michael, thanks again. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.